By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Jesus Christ Himself said, Blessed are they who hear the Word of God. Step one. Which is what you are doing. And keep it. Step two, which is something we all need to focus on more and more each day. Please join me in hymn 509. How shall the young secure their hearts? That holy book will guide our youth and well support our age. Mark 10, 13 to 16 is perhaps one of the most well-known of the events out of Jesus Christ's life history here on earth. And there are several factors here to appreciate. But, but one of the most important factors that we as adults need to learn from Jesus here is how though weary at the end of his day he welcomed the presence of children into his life he joyfully received them and joyfully blessed them I think sometimes we grow away from that joyful blessed reception of children in our lives whether they're our own or somebody else's you know, running up to us say, Mom, 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 Dad, 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 Dad. You know, and then as they get older, that doesn't stop. <laughs> and it should be a joy to know they still turn to Christian adults, to Christian parents, in order to help them continue not only to know what the training and instruction of the Lord is, but to continue to pursue that training and instruction as one of the most blessed pursuits of life on earth. And it starts among the youngest. In the book of Luke, where this account is paralleled, the word that is used there to describe those who shall inherit the kingdom of God is la brefe, the infants, the tiniest ones. Give your careful attention to Mark 10, 13-16. People were bringing their children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to his disciples, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And Jesus took the children up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. And the word there in the Greek means to praise someone for their love for Jesus Christ. Please join me in hymn 512. 
Let children hear the mighty deed. and fulfillment of the Savior would come through them. Generations after the first promise of salvation was made to Adam and Eve, mankind continued in its sinful ways. 
to a point that filled God with grief. The Lord wiped mankind and creatures off the earth away with a tremendous flood. In his faithfulness, however, God preserved his promise of salvation by saving Noah and his family in the ark. In addition, God promised us not to well, promise not to replicate such a flood. of salvation, God carried the promise through his chosen people, just as he carried the promise through individuals such as Adam, Eve, and Noah. God promised to establish a nation to carry the promise. This nation would, be, would come through one man, Abram, and be known as Israel. Before the Israelites lived in a land of their own, they suffered as slaves in Egypt. After years in slavery, however, God sent Moses to Pharaoh to free the descendants of Abram. God promised to deliver the Israelites from Egypt and lead them into the promised land. God's main purpose for establishing the nation of Israel was to carry the promise of the Savior. This promise was specifically passed on to Mary, a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. God promised that the Savior would put an end to death and usher in a heavenly The promise came through the Israelites. <laughs> the Savior came through the Israelites. God promised for salvation is for all the world. Jesus' death on the cross paid for everyone's sins. And his resurrection is assurance that all believers throughout the world will his salvation Just as God promised painful labor and painful childbearing to Adam and Eve, God promises that our walk with Christ in this world will not always be easy. However, God reminds us that in the midst of trials, tribulations, and persecutions, he has already sealed the victory over the world's troubles. These troubles will not last forever, and Jesus promises to share his victory with us. also promises us additional help as we walk through this world awaiting the ultimate victory in the resurrection with Christ. Already armed with the word of God and all his promises, Jesus promises us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our counselor in the faith as we walk with Christ. promises us the Holy Spirit to help us in our walk with in faith and promises to share his victory over sin and death with us when he comes again to usher 
his kingdom. He also promises to be with us in the meantime. So he sits at the right hand of the Father, resurrected glory. He is also by our side through journey in this world, through our through our trials and triumphs. Our Savior promises that he is always with us.
Would you please rise? In brief, an excellent summation you have just heard that grace, mercy, and peace are already yours. They've been accomplished through the promise that was preserved and fulfilled by our Father in heaven through His Son, Jesus Christ. Hold on to this great truth. Treasure it. Not a lot of people have the same kind of certainty you have that through Christ you are going to heaven when you die. The Word of God for this morning from Deuteronomy chapter 6, these words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded? Tell him. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised on oath to our forefathers. This is God's word. We bow our heads in prayer. O well, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts now be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength. You are our Redeemer. Amen. Please sit down. So, dear friends of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, after that uh, wonderful, concise, Brief presentation, you were thinking, ha-ha, no sermon this morning. <laughs> and truly, I don't want to sermonize the praises that the lips of children have given to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I commend them for the hard work that they put in. I commend the staff for working with them as often as they have to do something the Scripture enjoins upon us all. Impress them on your children. Impress them on your children. Talk about them constantly. When you're in your homes, when you're walking about with them, whether it's a, a travel to the mall or maybe just a vacation journey, you know, tie them on your foreheads, phylacteries were very popular. Little Bible passages and closed in a small case and tied around the forehead as a constant reminder of who saved us and whose children we are. But we're not back in the Old Testament era and, and we're not any longer in the first century of the New Testament era. So how do we go about doing this in the era of such wonderful technology as is available to us. Well, I'm going to just use one word this morning and expand on it briefly. Kindle. Or is that old technology already, huh? Yeah. It might be, but it was an interesting word to use to describe this technology that you could carry with you in a relatively convenient form, in a relatively lightweight and have access through it to so much information, including the Word of God. Kindle also refers to an idea that they probably did know about in the Old Testament era, in the first century of the church, and also in our century now. You, you kindle a fire. 
How? Don't ask me. I'm no good at making fires. But I've seen people who do know how to do it well do it. And they don't start out by throwing a log on and then holding a match to the log. They start out smaller with paper or other wood products that will alight faster and provide the kindling power to grow into a larger flame that will set the log on fire. They kindle a flame that grows larger and larger as the fire grows. Kindle also is a word that refers to baby rabbits. A kindle is what you call a small batch of baby rabbits. Bringing them forth into the world is sometimes referred to as kindling. <laughs> so we've got some really good ideas here that are concrete, uh, metaphorical, and, and we need to take home with us today. And not just for the benefit of the, of the children that we know and love and receive as joyfully as Jesus did, but for the benefit of the children of God that exist throughout this world that you have contact with in your daily lives. Um, I've also been told that, you know, to, to keep the fire going, you don't just always throw on another log. You put in some smaller pieces of wood and build air passages that can flow and the fire can build up. Yeah. Every day we have these opportunities. More than likely when we're talking to people who share the same confession that we do. But even those people need kindling. We as Christians often forget the great fellowship that we share and the responsibility that comes with that fellowship. When Paul was writing to Christian congregations in the first century, those letters God preserved down through time for us to read and learn from, quite often you will find in them encouragement two Christians to kindle anew the flame of fire in brothers and sisters in whom that flame was dying or had died out. And that responsibility hasn't changed over time. In one of the great passages, it talks about how the Word of God was inspired by God. It says it's profitable for correction, for rebuke, for training, and instruction in righteousness so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I'm sure that each of us have come into situations where the responsibility to correct was ours. Because our friend was telling us, or our child was telling us, or a co-worker was telling us about some sin or other that they had joyfully indulged in. And we became a bit shy and we tiring and reserved about saying, do you realize, of course, that you are sinning against God? Too often we've had the opportunity to stand by the side of sick beds, people who are possibly going to recover, sometimes people who are not. And we, we, we find ourselves at a loss for words. Why would this be for us who know the truth, and by that truth have been set free, have had those truths impressed upon us. They, they are like tattoos on our brain, tattoos on our heart that we can share. And, and certainly it might be a scary thing to do that. We might be intimidated by the fact we're handling the very Word of God, but God has promised you His Holy Spirit, and through that Spirit works on the people who hear what you have to say. And let's not even make it about desperate situations or you know, the potential death of a friend or a family member or someone who's lying in a sickbed in a hospital. How about sometimes when a child notices something about the earth around him or her? Or perhaps on a, on a day when we're, we're driving to work with someone and we just bring up the fact of the wonders of the nature that we noticed on our last hike up into the Santan Mountains. Or up to the flat iron in the superstitions. Or maybe just walking along and noticing this small growth budding out of the earth and giving thanks to God 
for the physical laws he set in motion. And having, if we have children with us, directing our attention. Look, God has promised seed time and harvest will not fail till he returns in glory. I could go on and on. So many missed opportunities to reflect on what we know, what we believe, what we confess, what we live for, and what we are willing, if necessary, to die confessing. So, when it says, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Uh, maybe we need to start taking up that discipline as a structured way to remind us. I get up in the morning, I read a scripture. I walk through the day, and when I have a moment for pause, I try to recall a scripture to my memory. When I get home at night, I remember to say my prayers in the evening. And perhaps a good habit that I fell out of is to say that same prayer with my family rather than isolate myself from that potential interaction that would kindle anew faith in those who know and love the Lord. It's not an impossible task. If you're talking about rabbits, <laughs> well, who created them? Who made it possible for a Kindle to come into the world? If you're talking about fires, as you're kindling the fire, you can talk about the wonder of God's physical laws and how they interact to create such an awesome spectacle as a simple flame or a comfortable fire. When you're dealing with children, the youngest and most impressionable among us, and sometimes maybe feel a little bit put upon by their constant demands, is it not the wisdom given to us by God to get down on our knees if they're at that level, or to stand eye to eye if they're taller? and open up our arms and welcome the little children or the older children or the most senior child of God into our embrace and simply say, God loves you as much as He loves anyone on the face of this planet. It's just a little thing. But isn't it amazing how a little spark can set a forest on fire? You'll never know how much that simple little passage recited, that simple little encouragement offered, that kindling that you set around someone's small flame, they cause it to burst into a healthy fire for the rest of that individual's natural life. Before you can do that, impress it on yourself. Carry it with you like you would a Kindle. And always keep in mind the motivation behind it. Why should we obey all these commands? Why correct me? Why rebuke me? Why train me? Why instruct me? Because as God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt to preserve a promise for the whole human race, so He sent His Son to deliver us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. We know the truth, my son, my daughter. We have been set free by that truth. Let us rejoice in the freedom God has given to us by making it a part of our daily existence to rekindle in ourselves the flame that God set on fire in our hearts and to seek to rekindle that flame in all our brothers and sisters from the youngest among us the most senior saint. We are going to the promised land. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ unto life everlasting. Amen. Please, the Apostles' Creed is printed in 
the bulletin, also now up on the monitors. This is the simple, most basic confession of the Christian church for centuries. It is what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will return to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our offering. Thank you, brothers. For our opening prayer, please open up your hymn books. Turn to hymn number 513. We will say this in unison. Following that, we'll offer the special intercessions I've mentioned earlier in addition uh, one other, uh, Ann McBrien, Tim's mom, Michael's grandmother, uh, 77th birthday, but she is in long-term memory care, incapacitated, and waiting for her life to end. As a Christian woman, we know that her physical life may end, but her eternal life goes on with God in heaven. These will be our special intercessions after those. The Lord's Prayer. And please note, we're using the modern English version as going to be printed on the, presented on the monasters and printed in your bulletin. But first, hymn 513. You may remain seated, but join me in sending these thoughts to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, the children's friend, to each of them your presence send. Call them by name and keep them true in loving faith, dear Lord, to you. In Christian homes, Lord, let them be your blessing to their family. Let Christian schools your work extend in living truth as you intend. That caring parents, gracious Lord, and faithful teachers find reward in leading these to whom you call to find in Christ their all in all. That all of us, your children dear, by Christ redeemed, may Christ revere. Lead us in joy that all we do will witness to our love for you. Please give your devout and careful attention to the words I now offer for us all. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, You are the God of life and death. You created this universe and every living being who ever occupied earth's soil owes life and breath and everything else to You. So we say our times are in Your hands. You watch over all our comings and goings. We ask You to watch over Mr. Fred Carroll. 
friend to a friend of our brother, Bill Stone. You know better than we do the current state of his emotions. You know the thoughts that are running through his mind. It is evident that he is filled with despair and anger towards so many people in this world, perhaps towards himself, even perhaps towards you. We know, Heavenly Father, that you can deliver him from these conditions. He needs to hear your word of truth, the truth that can set him free from despair and anger and turn him in hope to your Son and his Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray that such witness may be granted to him by whatever means are available to you. Send a messenger of your grace and peace to his bedside. And may the words of truth that can set him free be spoken. And by your Holy Spirit's power, implanted in his heart, entrenched in his mind, and relieve him from his fears, his despair, and his anger. We realize... Heavenly Father, that the medical community has rendered its decision. Nonetheless, we pray that if it is your will for his life, that you grant him a miracle of healing, so that sustained by your truth in his worst possible hour of affliction, he might be restored to new life in Christ and be moved to share his witness with others. We thank and praise you for granting to our sister Robin successful surgery and now ongoing recovery from that surgery. There may be some weeks of therapy ahead of her, but she is grateful to you and to the medical assistance you have provided to her that she is once more more mobile than she was before. We pray that her recovery would continue at a good pace, smoothly and fully. We ask you also to watch over Tim McBrien's mom, Michael's grandmother, Annie. We realize, O oh Lord, that at 77 years of age, her memory may not be as sharp as it once was. But we also know that she is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that He indwells in her, and that as you told Philip, though outwardly we may waste away, inwardly we are renewed day by day. Though physical health and well-being and organic functions may dissipate, nonetheless, the promise of God stands sure. And that faith she has in Christ as Lord and Savior will never depart from her, but will be carried with her through life, through death, and home to confess it before her Lord and Savior in heaven. Meanwhile, give patience and endurance and encouragement to Tim and Michael both that in the face of this affliction, they do not despair, but they focus on the fact that their mom and their grandmother is in the Lord, that her salvation is assured. Finally, we thank and praise you for granting to Jason five, Mason five years of life in your world and to Ireland one year of life. The psalmist testified that children are a blessing from the Lord and the fruit of the womb is His reward. We thank you for entrusting these blessings to the parents who love and nourish these children every day, to Vanessa and Michael as they take up their role of bringing up these children in the training and instruction of the Lord. May you bless them with children who listen, who retain, and who as they grow older put into practice those things their parents teach them about Jesus Christ, His commandments, and His will. We pray that you grant them many more years of life in your world so that they may grow up not only to know the truth, but to be witnesses for the truth as well. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise for the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Brothers and sisters of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with His favor and always give to each and every one of you His peace. Amen, amen, amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn.